holy areas. Oh, wow. It was amazing. We're going to have to get on this. I'm going to have to watch out for these trips. I hate rainy weekends. Terrible it is. Okay. So we are going to cover um, two lessons today, 18 and 19. 18 technically I was supposed to assign to you guys to do over spring break, but we all know that wouldn't happen. So I saved it for this. Plus 18 and 19 kind of go hand in hand. They're both talking about um, about prayer. And, you know, when we cover two lessons in one class, then we go through them faster. And, hey, who doesn't like that? <laughs> so um, 18, we talk about how do we pray. Um, if you've got your books, go ahead and pull those out easier to follow along. I'm not going to make y'all do any um, reading along with me or anything. Um, so in this first part on how to repray, we're talking about um, that the Holy Spirit teaches the church to pray um, and the two kinds of prayer, and we've touched on it before, but the two kinds of prayer of um, prayer of petition and prayer of intercession. So prayer of petition is when we are asking God for something. It can be anything from a quick, uh, we have a quiz today, help, you know, a quick cry for help to, um, I've told you guys about when, um, it's huh? Okay. Test, pop quizzes, whatever, just a simple little, ah, help. Um, to, you know, when it starts raining and drivers are driving like they do in this town and you're just like, okay, guide the hands, the hearts, the minds of those around me. Please don't let these fools cause an accident. That kind of thing. Those are prayers of petition. And then we have prayers of intercession. You guys know what the main difference is between the two? It's in the book. That's okay. See, I knew you guys didn't read. I wouldn't read it if I didn't have to either. No judging. So a prayer of petition is when you're asking for something for yourself, whereas a prayer of intercession is you're asking it for who? If you're not asking it for yourself, who are you asking it for? Alyssa? Someone else. Yeah. Someone else, anyone else, doesn't matter. As long as it's not for yourself, then it's a prayer of intercession. So that's where it's like um, asking for prayers for your mom, your dad, your brother, your sick dog, um, that sort of thing. Ask for prayers that your teacher forgets to give the pop quiz that she told you was going to happen or whatever. Um, that sort of thing. That's a, a prayer of intercession. Um all right, let me pull for you the um, did you know for this lesson. Uh, my share screen, hang in there a second. You know, miracles happen. Jesus performed many miracles during his public ministry. And he continues to work miracles in the church today. Jesus' first miracle was the changing of the water into wine at the wedding at Cana. He performed many more, such as healing people who were sick, casting out demons, and even raising someone from the dead. There have been many miracles in the church, well past Jesus' time on earth as well. The apostles performed miracles in Jesus' name, which we read about in the Acts of the Apostles. One such miracle was when Peter and John saw a beggar outside the temple who was crippled and couldn't walk. Peter and John didn't have money to give him, but Peter instead commanded him in the name of Jesus to get up and walk. He was instantly cured and was able to walk again. Over the centuries, there have also been a lot of miracles granted by Jesus. Some of these miracles involve a physical healing, while others are spiritual healings. Like when someone realizes they are forgiven and they feel a heavy weight lifted off their shoulders. Or when someone who was once an enemy becomes a friend. These two can be considered miracles. Sometimes miracles happen. We just need to open our eyes to see them. All right. 
So the next page kind of talks about how um, daily personal prayer. So we know that we pray as a group together, right? We've got mass. We've got um, the uh, liturgy of the hours, the, the praying in church, um, feast days, um, liturgical seasons, so like Easter and Lent and Advent and whatnot. Um, but those first disciples, um, once Jesus left, they struggled a little. So they hadn't really learned how to make daily prayer. It wasn't a complete habit for them. So they would get together whenever they could and they would pray and then they would have gatherings. And that's kind of where your early um, masses come from is those. Um, so in, let's see, my notes a second. All right, yeah. Um, uh, in the liturgy, we turn with the church to worship God. Yeah, so this is on page 164 to 165. It's just talking about um, how we can be an active participant in the liturgy of the church. So how many of you have ever been to a church service at a different denomination church? Addison has. Are you the only one? What, what, church, what kind of church was it? So another Christian church. Um, what was one of the things you, what's one of the differences that you noticed? Um, I noticed that they said different things than what we do. Yeah. Like yep. What about like physically? So in our church, we do a lot of up, down, up, down, kneeling, sitting, standing, right? Did you do that at the Methodist church? Uh-uh. My ex-husband is uh, Lutheran, and so I went with him a couple times to um, his Lutheran church, and I, I was like, it's almost boring when you're used to all the up, down, and moving around. You, it's, it's really easy to zone out in a church where you're just sitting there the whole time. I mean, like, really easy to zone out. Um, I'm half convinced that's why the Catholic Church has us, like, up, down, kneel, sit, stand, because you can't fall asleep that way. Not very easily anyway. You can still zone out a little bit, but not like the whole the whole mass, right? Have you guys ever zoned out? It's okay. I won't judge. I won't tell your parents. I know my kids would zone out. I zoned out when I was your age. It's okay. Um, luckily, uh, liturgy includes all kinds of prayers, including you guys have heard me say my favorite kind, which is the... Um, the songs, the, the hymnals. And um, when I was young, we initially, so I would originally go to St. Thomas More with my grandparents when I was little, little, because um, my mother was not active in the church. And my dad still isn't. Um, and then my mom became more active in the church and she started going to Good Shepherd. And so we started going to Good Shepherd, but we still would originally go kind of in the mornings. And those are the more traditional masses. Um, and then when I was in middle school, we started going to the, um, the 615 mass. It was 615 at the time. I think it's 6 p.m. now, but that was originally called the folk mass. Um, whereas the two morning ones were the very traditional, especially that eight o'clock, very traditional. Like I think of it as like the old person, um, mass, you know, where it's straight out of the hymnal and just very traditional. Um, 1015 was a little more contemporary and then the 6 and 6 15 that was that was like a lot of the kids went to that one and the, that choir had guitars it was all like acoustic guitars and then we had the piano um and i joined that choir and that's when i really started paying attention more <laughs> um kind of had to when, when, when you're in your choir when you're in the choir because you're leading a lot of it um but that was always the big part for me of how I became uh, paying more attention to mass and um, engaging in the mass was through song. Um, and one of the things I gave you guys in your lesson plan, which um, you guys may or may not have seen, was um, it's talking about one of the passages from Exodus. 
Um, it's written down as a prayer, um, but it's not the kind of prayer you would normally associate with prayer because how it originally was handed down was as a song. Um, so think about, you know, way back in the day when all this stuff was being written, but this is, this is talking about um, something that came down through Miriam and the women as they safely crossed the Red Sea. So we're like, we're way back in the day. This is like the, you know, Moses kind of time frame. Um, did, did they have these? Mm-mm. Mm-mm. So how was how was stories um, and stuff told and retold and handed down through the generations? Yep. Yep. Francesca's got it right. Yep. Orally. Oral history. Um, so song was a great way to pass on stories and prayers and stuff because... What's easier to memorize, a speech or a song? I mean, songs most of us, songs. Speech. Yeah, I mean, everyone's a little different, but songs tend to be a little easier because there tends to be rhymes and, yeah, so um, a song because they're, it's very easy to memorize. That's how a lot of those things were handed down. So um, I'd ask for you guys to think of one of your favorite hymns or praise and worship songs and what lines really kind of jump out at you do you ever have um i'm sure you guys have lines from like you know top 40 trendy songs that you know you and your friends who kind of quote a line here or there from songs right everybody's got those things um are there any from songs from church or praise and worship music that sometimes a line will kind of stick in your head or you, just, you think about it, you hear it, and there's that one particular line in a song that you're like, oh, yeah. Yeah, like it really resonates with you. You feel something with you. Have you guys ever had that happen? Yeah. Got a couple nods. Yeah. So um, what I wanted to do real quick was share um, a song with you. You guys know I like to do this periodically. Um, this was a song that was... Um, I first heard it good 20 years ago, 25 years ago, 20, 25, somewhere in there. I don't know. It all starts to run together, you know, when it gets to be that long ago. Um, so I can't play a video for you because there is no video. <laughs> So it's just, you're looking at a still screen, but I want you to listen to the song um, and kind of really think about it for a minute, okay? So I'm going to pull that up real quick. Who am I? 